is Wall Street coming to crypto a good thing? Everybody's been anticipating, it seems like, promise of bringing big money in. And if big money comes in, then the price of Bitcoin goes up and we all make money. Hey guys, welcome back to the series we're doing on Wall Street, uh, the institutions coming into Bitcoin and crypto, the financialization of the space. This is a four part series. We're on video number three. So if you haven't seen videos one and two, make sure you do that. Um, to this video, we're gonna talk about the dangers of Wall Street coming in and this financialization. Now in video one, if you haven't gone back again, go back and watch this because it really kind of sets the stage for where we're at. And we talked about Bitcoin being multidimensional and there's, there's a lot more to Bitcoin and you really need to understand all the parts, the money, the banking, the politics, um, the investment side, the technology side. You have to understand all that to really understand where it's going. Um, you need to, uh, we talked about as institutions coming to crypto being a good thing um, and good being relative, right? We talked about debt-based assets versus equity-based assets, so that's super important to understand. Um, you need to understand that to understand really what they're trying to do Bitcoin and how they're going to change that. Um, we're talking, we talked about how that's a big problem for Wall Street for them to really get their way, but they're figuring it out pretty quickly. Um, and we talked about how there's not enough Bitcoin for Wall Street and how they're going to want to get past that 21 million cap that we have. Now, in video number two, we talked about Wall Street's desire to financialize um, Bitcoin and crypto. We talked about what, what financialization even means. Uh, we talked about Wall Street's desire, like I said, to create more Bitcoin because 21 million is not gonna be enough. We talked about hypothecation. We use that new word, rehypothecation, IOUs piling up. We talked about the good and the bad because good's a relative term. So I kind of outlined the good and the bad and you can kind of figure out where you sit in that equation. And then we talked about creating assets out of thin air, how they've done that with gold, how they do that with dollars and how they want to do that with Bitcoin. So go back and watch videos one and two. In this video, we're going to talk about, or I should say for the rest of the series, we're going to talk about creating the more than 21 million Bitcoin, the financialization of Bitcoin, more good and bad uh, regarding those topics. <clears throat> the Wall Street takeover, are they gonna be successful with capturing the market? And then again, what we can do about it. So getting right into it, I know I've been uh, kind of going a little bit long, but getting right into it, um, hopefully you've been enjoying this. Um, if you want deeper deeper dives into some of those subjects we talked about in this previous, previous videos or on this one, make sure you leave it in the comments. I try to answer every single comment personally. A lot of good discussions going on there, so make sure you leave comments. And of course, leave me a thumbs up. That lets me know that you like these videos and I'll keep doing them for you. So anyway, back into it. Where it goes bad with Bitcoin, or I should say with the institutions and Wall Street getting into Bitcoin is this leverage. So leverage is, uh, leverage is like playing with fire. It can keep you warm and it can burn your house down. All right, I've, I've unfortunately seen the best and the worst of it in my own personal investments, especially in real estate. Uh, it's kept me really warm and it burned my house down. So leverage is really bad, but what does it mean on a global level? And we saw some of that in 2008 when this whole housing market crashed and it really took down banks across the globe. So leverage goes really bad, but there is such a thing as good debt um, and there's bad debt. So good debt is when someone owns an asset and then and they lend it. So now um, it's an asset that's backing that claim and there could be good debt, but bad debt means I don't own the asset and I lend it anyway. So that's going back to last week, we talked about hypothecation and rehypothecation. So I don't own the asset, but I lend it anyway. And so in the financial system, that gets really bad because it's creating money out of thin air because more people think they own the asset than really do like a game of musical chairs. I talked about like a chocolate bar. If I own a chocolate bar and I give you a piece of paper saying I owe you a chocolate bar, you pass that piece of paper on of several times. Now all these people think they own one single asset, okay? So it's like a game of, of, of musical chairs and when it's spread across trillions of dollars, it becomes a massive problem. So that's what leverage does in the financial system. And a really, really good example of this actually happening is with Dole Foods, all right? So most people think, oh, that sounds ridiculous, it'll probably never happen, but it does, it happens all the time. So if you own stock, um, Facebook, Google, Apple, whatever, it, it's a security. And the way that securities markets work is exactly like this. So I don't actually own the stock, it's owed to me, it's owed to them, it's owed to somebody else, etc. And what happens is they lose track of how many people actually own the stock. And so a perfect example is Dole Foods. In 2013, they wanted to buy all the stock back. 
<clears throat> and so what they did is they had to calculate, okay, how many shares of stock are out there and how much do we have to pay? And they said they found out there was 49.2 million claims of stock, but there was only 36 million shares. That means there was 33% more. That means that one out of three people didn't actually have a stock. They thought they did. One out of three people were left without a chair to sit in when the music shut off. It happens all the time. Now, the reason why this came to light is because of the unique circumstances with them trying to buy it back. But um, even by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, it's like the World Bank, um, per their last report, they showed that um, 2.8 assets for every or 2.8 assets are pledged for every one physical asset and the funny thing is is that it's not enough they want more they state they want more because they want more lubrication in the financial system they want money moving faster and the 2.8 so almost three it's actually down in the in the financial crash in 2008 it was actually four four assets pledged for every one physical back. So this is not some crazy thing. This is how it works. Dole was a perfect example of that, but per the IMF's own research, right now it's 2.8 to one. So one out of three people don't have something they think they did. Now it happens every day. Now, how does this happen? All right, so here's, a, here, here's how it happens. So the way everyone owns a stock is that you have this company, CEC, they're a nominee of the Depository Trust, and basically they pledge it down to the broker, down to E-Trade, and then E-Trade pledges it to me. So E-Trade owes it to me, it's owed to E-Trade, it's owed to them, and so forth. That's exactly how it happens. And it's kind of simple. You would think with the way technology is today, they would be able to keep better track of it. And this is why putting securities on the blockchain is the most perfect fit in the world. But the problem is, is they have to give up all this crazy financialization, rehypothecation. And of course they don't wanna do that because that's how they make all their money by inflating this. But if they just put stocks on the blockchain, I can own and I can own the custody, I can custody my own stocks. So we're gonna see that. I really believe that, that this new technology, Bitcoin and the technology is going to reinvent the financial system, but they're not gonna go away quietly because they wanna to continue to play this game so they can keep making money. Now, the good type of financialization happening in crypto right now, so you're probably asking yourself, is this happening? When is this gonna happen? Well, it already is. It's already happening, but so far it's been what I would consider good. Again, good being relative. So <clears throat> we've seen futures come in. So in December of 2017, we saw futures. We saw CBOE and CME come in. Now, <clears throat> I wouldn't necessarily call these good. I'm not a fan of them because they're betting on the price of Bitcoin. They're not buying Bitcoin. So going back to that gold example from last video, we want people to buy the asset because that pushes the price up. We don't want them just to bet against it. And that's what happened. But at least with those, it's cash settled. So they're not racking up IOUs on it. It's not a debt-based asset at this point um, they, because they don't, th those don't require delivery. Because it's not a debt-based asset, they can't create more claims against it. So they're not piling all those IOUs up on it. <clears throat> but Wall Street is figuring this out. They really want to start piling that on. But as we kind of we kind of talked about before, Bitcoin was designed for me to hold. I hold the custody. I don't have counterparty risk. And so as long as I hold my keys, I'm winning the war against Wall Street but Wall Street wants to pull back. And so they're gonna create these financial assets that cause me to give my keys back. So right now, I'm holding them, but Wall Street's trying to pull them back from me, and that's why they're coming up with all these kind of, these, these uh, exotic, as we might call them, um, things like ETFs. So that's what everyone's talking about, these ETFs. So <clears throat> as long as I'm, I'm a long-term holder, and I'm keeping my coins in my own wallet, in my cold storage, my hardware wallet, I control it and they can't do that. But if I'm a trader, if I'm trading every day, my coins are left on an exchange. And that means they own them, they have control over them, and now they can have their way with them. So who's gonna win the tug of war? And really that's part of what this is about. You need to understand the way the game works so you can figure out which side of this tug of war you wanna be on. Now, will Wall Street be able to take over crypto? That's a big question. <clears throat> we know that Wall Street is there to make money. I mean, 
50 years ago, you go to downtown Manhattan, 50 years ago, all those buildings were all industry. Today, it's all finance. That's what Wall Street does. They make big money out of nothing, out of thin air. If you go remember in week one, you saw that chart that shot up out of nowhere. And so they, they make money and they do it out of thin air and they want to control Bitcoin. They saw that Bitcoin had a better return than anything that they've ever seen in their life and they want in. Problem is, is they're gonna wreck it, probably, right? So, but the only way that, that Wall Street institutions can get a hold of it is to financialize it because obviously nobody owns Bitcoin. They can't just go buy the company. There is no company to buy. There is no board to control. There's no way they can control that. So what they can do is they have to financialize it to create these derivatives markets around it. And the way that derivatives should work is like I said, always have a one to one ratio, but that's not what Wall Street does because they can't make money that way. So they wanna just pile on these assets over and over. So here's the strategy. This is their game plan right here. This is what they're gonna try and do. So they wanna create claims against crypto that aren't fully backed by the underlying coin. So this is, uh, they'll do margin loans, coin lending, rehypothecation, stuff like that. So uh, coin settled futures contracts or ETF. So for an ETF, for example, I think I'm buying Bitcoin through an ETF, but really I'm only buying a piece of a Bitcoin. And then what that ETF does is they say, hey, we have all these people that think they own Bitcoin and it's worth $100 million, we'll loan that to somebody else who will now count that as an asset and will get loaned out again and again, all on the same Bitcoin. So it creates all these claims against Bitcoin, multiple claims against one individual coin. Now we haven't seen that happening yet, but this is what they're going to try and do. For now, all the Bitcoin derivatives, they're all cash settled. So we haven't seen that yet, but it's coming. And this is what these ETFs are about. Now, um, the cash settled derivatives are lower because they're not piling up those debts. They're not becoming IOUs. And, and so it's, just, it's, it's not near as bad as this fractional thing. So Bitcoin by its nature is what we call hard to borrow, right? If I own it, it's an equity-based asset, we talked about that in week one, Ex equity-based asset, but as soon as it becomes a debt-based asset, then it's easy to borrow, and then we'll start to see all those prices start piling up. So that's the strategy. So eventually, what I think is that regulators are going to approve Bitcoin settled derivatives. It's gonna happen. I mean, we have an ETF pending next month. It's the VanEck, it's the CBOE VanEck ETF. I think it has a pretty good chance of being approved. If this one doesn't get approved, one, one will get approved after it. I mean, it's, it's, it's only a matter of time. And then that's when things change. So if that happens, will the banks start borrowing the underlying Bitcoin? Is, are those regulators smart enough to see what you and I see right now? Are they smart enough to prevent this? My guess would probably be not because they haven't really done anything to change the system since 2008. As a matter of fact, it's really only gotten worse. So will they allow banks to borrow the underlying Bitcoin? Um, will the custodians that are holding these coins, will they make them a borrow of, available to be borrowed, right? This can all be stopped. It can all be prevented, but probably not. Will they do that? Will they prevent it from being borrowed? Um, in these coin lending markets, will they turn them into securities? Will they loan them out? Or Will they see that these risks of lending the Bitcoin are too great? Will they see that? Will they see that? Will they see the institutions, um, you know, that the problem with lending these out and the risk that they put into their customers, will they see that and prevent that? Hopefully, cryptocurrencies will remain hard to borrow, and hopefully, you and I can continue to make them hard to borrow by continuing to hold. All total our coins, keep our coins, even if we're trading our coins, at least taking those keys and those coins back into our own pockets. And that's, that's what we're gonna do to protect the space. So what's my view on all this, right? I've given you a lot of if you're this, you're this, if you're this, you're this. So my view is that financialization is good and bad, right? I gave you the good and the bad arguments already. I mean, it's good because new investors come in, they bring more money in, you know, there's the network effects we talked about, increased security. So I, I like all of those things. Um, but I just see this epic battle between these, these hodlers and speculators, which we've already seen waged in, in gold. So unfortunately, gold kind of tells us already the way it goes. The difference is, is owning gold is, is hard. Try and take delivery of a ton of gold to your house. It's very difficult. 
where do I keep it? I don't have a big enough save. It's not you know, down to my floor. I don't have security. But bestowing Bitcoin is much easier. So it is a different asset. And so from that perspective, it's different. So it's going to be an epic battle, I think. Um, I think that we'll see more of the good financialization. And I think that ultimately Wall Street is going to be unable to capture Bitcoin. And the reason why is not because they're going to, is not because of lack of effort. They're going to try, but there's a way that Bitcoin can fight back. All right. So the dangers of financialization of Bitcoin are that crypto and institutions are going to be, they're, they're, they're not investing compatible. That's the problem. Is, and I, I want to answer in the next video series, is crypto a threat to the institutions, to Wall Street, or is Wall Street a threat to Bitcoin? And I think Bitcoin's a threat to Wall Street. And I'm going to tell you exactly why. Now, the problem is for them to be a threat to Wall Street, for them to break out of the cage, it's going to be dangerous. So it's a really dangerous game. So just make sure you stay tuned for the next video on that. In the next and final video, so only one more piece, we're going to talk about fractionally reserved Bitcoin. Now, fractionally reserved might be a new word for you. If you don't understand that our banking system in the United States is what we call a fractional reserve banking system. Spend a couple minutes on Google and figure that out or I'll talk about it next week. I'm gonna talk about the risks and dangers for institutions. Like I said, I think they're gonna try. I don't think they're gonna be successful, but it could be very dangerous. So we're gonna talk about that. The reason why is there's this, what we call the lender of last resort. There's none of that. And I'll talk about what that is. And we're talking about these fractional reserve Bitcoins and, and the risk because of a fork in Bitcoin, which has happened before. So that's what we're gonna talk about next week. Again, give me a thumbs up if you like this. If you want me to dive deeper into any of these topics, make sure you leave it in the comments. If you have questions, if I'm not clear about this, make sure you leave comments, I'm gonna answer those for you. Other than that, I'll be out uh, on the next video and I'm done here to your success. I'm out.